we had to leave the island and go to see everybody we went to see. It was nothing to do in Cape Ann. I went to see when I was 14 years old. I went to Nicaragua, down into Mosquito Keys to catch turtles. That was my my first trip. I'm the only one left out of, out of that crew in 1947. I didn't think I would make it, but I did. <laughs> Paul Adolf Hurston, born in South Sound, January 11th, 1931. My, my sister was a school teacher. I went to school to her for about four, five, four or five years or something like that. One room schoolhouse, barefoot, no uh, sleep, no, had no exercise book or anything like that. And so I was the youngest out of 10 children. And things were so different here in Cape in those days, but uh, we made it. Leaving my, my school here in Southside, I went, attended a school in Georgetown. The, the teacher was teacher Edwin Percival Ferguson from Jamaica. And it was, it was very, ex it was a private school, very expensive in those days. Family paid about two pounds a, a, a month of that. But he was a good teacher, he was a good teacher. And uh, I remember my, all my classmates. I'm the only one, left, to my knowledge, I'm the only one left out of them. I went to see when I was 14 years old. I went to Nicaragua, down into Mosquito Keys to catch turtles. That was my, my first trip. You needed big muscles that day. You didn't need too much up here. Just big muscles and hard work. It was nothing to do in Cape Ann all day. Men, boys of my age wanted, we had to leave the island and go to see everybody we went to see. I didn't think I would make it, but I did. <laughs> my first ship was a banana boat, a ship named the Truxton. We were sailing out of um, Guatemala, Puerto Barrios, to Tampa with bananas. The second one was, uh, was the Romana. And then I uh, that was in 1949, things was very bad in the States. All the ships was coming in laid up, laid up. And I got a job on uh, converting a yacht. She was, the, she was named a welder, owned by the, or she was bought by the man that invented the parachute. And we converted her into a banana boat, a, a beautiful yacht she was, converted into a banana boat. And Fourth trip to uh, uh, on our ship burnt down, the pot of iron burnt down in the Pacific. We had to take the lifeboats for it, and they, they were all wooden boats and leaking. Oh my God! But but a Spanish ship picked us up that same night. We were in the we were about about ten hours drifting. And a Spanish ship took us back, brought us back to on, on the Pacific. It took brought us back to Balboa. And uh, we flew, flew back to Miami and we got another ship, we went out again. So I didn't deter none of us because we were all young. I needed a job, that, that was the thing. And I, to, to, I'm the only one left out of, out of that crew in 1947. So I was sick and I had to come home and then I went back. And I got on several ships at the last. Uh, this one was the uh, Daytona. She was at the converted LST. We were running bauxite from British Guiana to Trinidad that's really. And then we got a charter to go to uh, Canada to run a gypsum rock from Hansport, Nova, Nova Scotia to New York, Philadelphia, and Jacksonville. And I took in with a pain around my heart in the month of November 1955 and I had to get off the ship. And uh, I went to the Marine Hospital in Stockdale in New York, and that ship went out and never did come back. Two Cape Islanders on her 
guy from a uh, chief mate was from Raspe, Sherlock Farrington, and Fletcher Sebo from uh, Georgetown. He got in a heavy gear sight. Lost everybody. I got off work for about, about 14 days before it happened. I went uh, with national boat carriers naturally. I was with them from 1956. March 1956 to, uh, I can't remember. I had a, my ship was, in Agustan was her name. We had uh, got commissioned to go to, uh, up the Mississippi River, Tennessee, Ohio and Tennessee River, up to Chattanooga, Tennessee, to load a nuclear reactor. I am the only person since 1929 that commanded a foreign ship to load cargo in one U.S. port and discharge it to another. They had the waiver, the, the Jones Act. All of that is recorded in Washington. All of that is... I had a naval commander breathe down the back of my neck for about three days, questioned on every conceivable accident. And we passed in flying colors. It took me a long time to make a captain. It took me about 10, 12 years or something like that. I came up with a the ordinary seaman, A.B., bosun, third mate, second mate, chief mate before that. So when I got up, it became a captain. I didn't have to ask somebody what to do. I was already trained. I knew what to do. I knew what to do. If I was to go back to sea today, I would be like a cabbage. I would be so green, I wouldn't know what. <laughs> but that was always my ambition, because my, my brother was a captain. That was always my ambition. And I used to admire these, these ship, ship, the old sailors, that's what come in, they came on all these. Captain Eugene Thompson, Captain Reginald Parson. They were respected. The captain of the ship was respected those days. So. I, I wanted that. It's, it's not many of us left around. They were very, very good at their, at their work. Most of us didn't have any education, but they had a lot of experience. I'd been on fire. I'd been aground. I'd been in collision. I'd been in dozens and dozens of storms and all kinds of things. I'm still here.